calling is the song answer. Stab, stab. You guys need to pull it together. <laughs> How about paying an editor? I feel like it's never happened. Don't like zombies. I hate zombies. I avoid zombies at all costs. Hey guys, it's Leanna and I'm here today to talk about the best and the worst books that I've read so far in 2021. We're at the halfway point in the year, more or less. <laughs> Pretty much exactly for when I'm filming this right now. More or less exactly for when it's going up, hopefully, if I edit in time. <laughs> I figured now's a good time to check in and see what's been good, what's been bad so far this year. And therefore what are contenders for best and worst of the year overall when I do my end of year videos. So I narrowed it down. I usually do 10 best and 10 worst end of the year. So I did five best and five worst because we're halfway through the year. That seemed fair. Also, I think I usually do this because this seems like a thing that I would always think. I don't know that I've always specifically mentioned it as a rule for me. I don't pick rereads for either category. I mean, well, it would be really silly to have a reread in the worst category. I, I suppose, now that I think about it, last year I totally could have because one of the worst books that I read was a reread because it had been a long time and I was rereading it and I was like, dear God, why did I ever like this? I suppose it's possible. But yeah, basically I don't do rereads because mainly for the reason that a lot of my favorite books I our favorites and that's why I'm rereading them. So it would be unfair, like my whole best list would just be the books that I was rereading because that's why I was rereading them. So they all have to be my first time through. All right, so I figured we'd start with, what did I figure? I went back and forth trying to figure out if I'd start with best or start with worst. And I'm deciding right now because I don't remember what I decided. We're gonna start with worst and then we're gonna end on a positive note. I think that's what I decided. And I did rank them. So they're they're not in no particular order. They are in a particular order. So worst books, we're gonna do fifth worst first. So the best of the worst to the worst of the worst. And then we'll do the same thing with best books. We're gonna do the worst of the best and the best of the best. <laughs> okay, enough explanations. I think you know what this video is. <laughs> so the best of the worst or the least worst is Deal with the Devil by Kit Roka. Kit Rocha. I still don't know how to say the other's name. Yeah, that's what, that was the Blades and Bodice Rippers book club pick for June. And unfortunately, Blades and Bodice Rippers hasn't had a lot of good luck in 2021 with choosing books that all of us or even any of us like. <laughs> but as usual, mine was the saltiest opinion. I hated Deal with the Devil. I am not entirely surprised by the fact that I hated Deal with the Devil. It's not like I went into it being like, this is gonna be a new favorite. How could it let me down? When I picked it up, I was like, I hope I like this, but I don't know because <laughs> it's urban fantasy and it, it is rare. It is the exception. In fact, I cannot think of any actual exception where I did like an urban fantasy. I don't want to say that's never happened, but I feel like it's never happened. I mean, unless uh, then I always give the caveat of like, well, technically, I guess Neil Gaiman writes urban fantasy because he's writing fantasies that take place in an urban environment. But when people talk about urban fantasy as a genre and the tropes that come with that, I don't think Neil Gaiman is really what they have in mind. <laughs> so yeah, urban fantasy is not really something I gravitate towards and I would really never choose to pick it up. I really only ever read it because he'll make me read it. <laughs> anyway, so um, how, however, however, it was blurbed and compared to Orphan Black, which is a show that I love. I actually need to catch up on that show. So I was like, all right, if it's like that, I'm totally gonna be able to get behind that. It is nothing like Orphan Black. There is one single thing about it that is kind of like Orphan Black and that's why they mentioned it. But as usual, whenever publishers are like, it's like this for fans of this, they're always wrong. <laughs> so once again, they were wrong. Orphan Black is excellent and this book was not. Even my co-hosts, my fellow Blades and Bodice Rippers book club ho hosts, I already said hosts, well whatever. Yeah, they, they liked it better because they tend to like urban fantasy just as a genre. So even, it's kind of like me with Grimdark where a lot of the time, like because I like Grimdark fantasy, even if it's not very good, I enjoy the stab stab. I enjoy you know, dark and, and, morally great characters. So I'll be able to derive some enjoyment from a less good version of that thing. So for them, I feel it's probably the same where they like urban fantasy, whereas I do not. So even though it's not like the best they've ever read, it's, it's a thing they generally like. So they're like, it's fine. So for me, it was not fun and I hated it so much. And I plowed through it as 
efficiently as I could so that I could be prepared for book club live show to discuss it and then never think about it again. Number four, uh, fourth worst is Shadow of Night by Deborah Harkness. This is the second book in the All Souls trilogy, which is the Discovery of Witches series. I was actually really excited to pick up the second book. I didn't love the first book, but based on how it ended and where I knew the second one would be going, I was very hopeful that I would like it better, that I would think that the first one is not great, but the second one has, pro it has the potential to be like actually kind of my jam. And it was horrible. It was so, so bad. I hated it so much. Oh, it was not better. It was not better. Everything that I disliked about Discovery of Witches, all of that got turned up to 11. So it was even worse than it was before because there were things in Discovery Witches that I was not loving. I was like, so that stuff was just like front and center, the forefront of the plot. That stuff being the like relationship stuff where it was like they were having the same conflict over and over and over again and both being so immature and yet also so possessive and the insta-love is just, it's just insane and the like I will die without you is frankly exhausting where every other page the authors found a reason for them to declare their undying love and I'm just like we fucking get it can you just like have a normal day can you just have a normal conversation can you not be immediately aggressively possessive <laughs> about somebody crossing the room and looking out a window and you're like how dare you look at a thing that isn't me i'm losing you <laughs> like you guys need to pull it together <laughs> the thing that i was excited about was the sort of the setting where it would be taking place and at first that kind of delivered for me but even that honestly really failed and it, uh, shockingly because the author is a history professor and while I think that did help in in Discovery of Witches, it actually, it, I don't, I mean, in Shadow of Night, mild spoilers for Discovery of Witches, at the end of Discovery of Witches, they're gonna, they like jump in time. So you know that in Shadow of Night, they're gonna be literally in the Elizabethan era. And so I was, that's what I was excited about. And it was just, the fact that it, it, it drew attention to it, to, it drew attention to this itself, which is something that I would have questioned anyway, but then part of me would have been like, well, but we always kind of make this leap when we read fiction, when we read historical fiction, that they're going to talk in a way that is comprehensible to us. Just like if you read about people in France, but it's a book in English, like, I mean, the assumption is that they're probably speaking French, but it's written in English. So, you know, like, you just assume that it's kind of like being real-time transliterated kind of, that, like this is meant to be French, but even though it's in English. So similarly, the fact that they'd be speaking in a slightly more modern way so that you, a modern reader, can understand, sure. However, when you have a present day person like transported back in time, this modern day person would necessarily be confronted by people who look and sound and talk in a way that is almost unintelligible because of how different speech and vocabulary and language and everything were. Um, back then. And so it's actually pointed out in the text how, what's her face, the main character whose name escapes me, how she's finds it almost difficult to understand them and they find it very difficult to understand her and they there's all this big song and dance about explaining her away as some cousin who came from somewhere far away and that's why she sounds like she does because she's American. That being said, all of the dialogue was weirdly casual and modern. And I was like, you can't tell me that Christopher Marlowe speaks in a way that's hardly comprehensible to our modern day person who's been transported to his time, but then also have all of Kit Marlowe's dialogue sound like some guy that you went to university with. <laughs> like, what? So, and the, just the relationship drama and the like weirdly like super accurate historical setting because she like nailed it as far as I can tell on the clothing and the customs and the food and the, all of that stuff. But the, like how people are talking, I was like, I don't think so. But I just, I hated every second of it and I don't recommend. I do recommend the show. It's not amazing, but it's fun. Okay, number three is From Blood and Ash by Jennifer L. Harmon Trout. And this is another Blaze and Bonnet reverse book club pick. Like I said, not the best of luck. In particular for me, and there's been several that none of us have loved, but I'm the one that usually is the one loathing. So yeah, I have a, I have a lengthy vlog of me reading From Blood and Ash. 
So I discussed my feelings and my reaction at length in real time in that video. So I don't want to say too much here. Because if you want like, I think it's like half an hour or 45 minutes. So if you want my full thoughts, that is there for you. But suffice to say, it was tropey and awful and the relationship was terrible. And the actual writing, like the, the prose was, was poorly constructed and grammatically incorrect. And just all around horribly constructed. It was a lot like Shadow of Night in terms of the relationship being horrible. The possessiveness and the the, the insta-loviness of it and just the horrible cringy dialogue. So it was kind of like Shadow of Night except Shadow of Night did have like at least there was clearly some knowledge of like a historical time period and of historical figures and how we could play with the actual timelines of real people to weave it into our witch and vampire love story even though I hated it. I give it points for that because that does require some knowledge and effort from Blood and Ash felt like no knowledge and no effort was put into it whatsoever. And I hated it so much. Number two is a book, actually like, uh, except for Shadow of Night, for every book on my worst list is a book that I was obligated to read for some, for one reason or another. Number two on my list is Destiny's Captive by Beverly Jenkins. This is a book that Bethany chose for me to read when she and I chose each other's TBRs. And, uh, Again, I have a vlog where I vlogged reading the book she chose for my TBR. So if you, I, half of that vlog is devoted to Destiny's Captive because I hated it. It's literally, I think half the runtime of that vlog is me just like plowing through that and hating it. <laughs> Again, don't wanna say too much here because I, I talked about it at length already. But suffice to say, I already don't tend to gravitate towards romance. There, unlike with urban fantasy, there are some romances that I have liked, historical romances. So like, I have enjoyed a lot of Tessa Dare, uh, who Amanda introduced me to. I love Grace Draven. That's not historical romance, it's fantasy romance. But Grace Draven, I'll read anything that woman writes. I don't always love what she writes, but I like most of it. So I have, the, there was the potential for me to like this, I suppose. It was historical romance with, uh, a ballsy heroine and some swashbuckling and piracy etc. So I, I guess I can see why Bethany thought that I would potentially like it but the main character, the main male character was so unlikable and I could not root for their romance because it opens with him blackmailing her into marrying him and then that just becomes like a cute running joke between them. I just like as, as a premise for their insta love connection turned blackmail marriage I was like no, I could never grow to love somebody that thought it was okay to do this. Ever. End of story. And that's kind of the jumping off point for their relationship. So it was doomed before it ever attempted to sail. So there was there was many, 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 many things that I hated about it throughout thereafter. But just as like from from the jump, there was just no chance that I was going to like this when that was how they came together. I was just like, nope. My number one worst book. I hope I have the vlog up before this video goes up but that's a lot of fucking editing to do. I stayed up until one in the morning last night reading this book and and therefore finishing the vlog in which I was reading it so I have a lot of footage to edit and it is the worst book that I've read so far this year without question didn't have to think about it one of the worst books that I have ever read and that was Dreams of the Dying by Nicholas Liesel. Now this is self-published so I feel I, I always say I would feel bad and I generally try not to go out of my way to shit on indie published or self-published books or authors because they just they don't have a whole the entire machine of like Penguin Random House or Simon and Schuster behind them so I, I'm, I'm like it feels like picking on the little guy. However, Dreams of the Dying in hardcover costs $40. Ah, uh, yeah. If you're gonna ask me to pay $40, then I have paid for the my right to complain about this because <laughs> it was horrible. And even though this wouldn't have saved it, but at the very least, again, if I'm paying $40 for this and clearly money was spent on artists for the cover design, artists for all the maps, artists for the bestiary. There's all this extra stuff in there and that's why it costs 40 fucking dollars. How about paying an editor? Because there were many, many things in it that were not a matter of opinion. They were wrong. They were incorrect. <laughs> they were either grammatically incorrect or they were not the correct usage of a word or they were not the correct usage of an idiom where this, this isn't a matter of debate. This isn't a matter of taste. This isn't a matter of anything like that. This is a matter of this is literally wrong. 
you needed to pay somebody to comb through this monstrosity. And again, I have so, so much beef with all of it that again, for me, that would not have saved it. But at the bare minimum, for a book that costs this much, I expect some polish. And the, the uh, visually speaking, it's very polished, but clearly it's style over substance. And that irritates me so much. It's not dissimilar from films that rely on having a huge, like, star-studded cast, amazing graphics, a great soundtrack. They don't have a story. And this is not dissimilar. So again, there's so, clearly so much attention paid to the look of this thing, and that's why I had to shell out 40 fucking dollars for this. And the story, and the writing, and the prose was atrocious. It was, again, one of the worst things that I have ever read. At the very least, I expect it to be not littered with so many errors, where it's literally wrong. But also, the book was just non-stop soapboxing and info dumping. When it wasn't soapboxing, it was info dumping. And it wasn't info dumping, it was soapboxing. And I... It was so insufferable and so lacking in subtlety, so lacking in elegance or nuance or complexity. This, this, the philosophies that it was spewing at me were at the level of like a middle schooler who's just beginning to ask existential questions. And the book purported to deal with, with really difficult issues, suicidal thoughts. So trigger warning if you're thinking of picking this up, which I obviously don't recommend. But it deals with, uh, the main character is clearly dealing with some kind of trauma and mental illness and suicidal thoughts. And there are other characters also dealing with these things, but it's handled in such a, like these characters don't feel like characters, they feel like vehicles for the author to soapbox and philosophize at us. And the things he is soapboxing about and philosophizing about are just not worth 700 pages. Like the things that he's saying, they are neither original nor deep nor complex, but he's going on and on and on and on about it in poorly constructed English and using what should be characters who are making character decisions in an interesting plot to instead use them to spew these ideas at us at length. It was horrible. It was, it, and I had so many like questions about then when it was philosophizing about these things that I was just like, okay, for one, why does every woman in the story seem to be suicidal? I mean, more so than even the main character. <laughs> Like, that seems to be the female solution here is to just kill yourself. I want it to be, if you've ever seen that video from like a long time ago, um, but there was, there was a series of videos on YouTube that were like uh, classic literature and how this could have been avoided if she'd had a sassy gay friend. So it'll be like Romeo, Juliet, Othello, Hamlet, all these kind of scenes where something tragic happens. And then this guy who made the videos would be the sassy gay friend to put a stop to this. And my favorite by far is Romeo and Juliet. And I bring this up because if you, I'm sure you know, but spoilers for Romeo and Juliet, the two of them kill themselves at the end. Um, and so, he, you know, Juliet has found Romeo dead and she's about to kill herself and in comes a sassy gay friend and she's explaining that, well, with, with Romeo is dead, uh, you know, what am I going to do? And uh, <laughs> the sassy gay friend goes, so we kill ourselves? Kill ourselves? <laughs> That's what I wanted to say to the character, to the female characters in Dreams of the Dying. I'd be like, so we kill ourselves? Kill ourselves? There was uh, the mystery, the, the main plot, like the, the, the central question and tension of the plot was resolved at around page 500, maybe 550, leaving 150 to 200 pages of falling action, which was really just the main in main character who was insufferable dealing with his own internal struggles and emotional issues and just more soapboxing and philosophizing and just there is literally no plot anymore because the plot has been resolved what plot there was. Now it's just that. It's literally just that for 150 to 200 pages. Why? But for why? <laughs> yeah, so zero out of 10, do not recommend. <laughs> okay, so let's end on a positive note. The best books that I've read this year. So much happier. <laughs> This part of the video will be way shorter because I always have less to say about books that I love. But number five, so the worst best, is Deathless Divide by Justina Ireland. This is the second book in the Dread Nation duology. I do think Dread Nation, the first book in the duology, is slightly a teeny bit better. And um, Mara, who I buddy read this with, um, she and I talked about it and we kind of agreed that the pacing would have worked better if this had been split up a bit differently because there's a point in Deathless Divide where there's like a big time shift. Uh, there's a big time jump and it's, it's quite jarring. So it seems, it seems to us that it would make more sense to have split this up a little more differently because having that happen in the middle of the book, it seems like that would be a better place to just end a book. So either make this a trilogy or move some of this into the first book or something. But like that 
kind of made this feel like kind of two on disconnected halves and so like the pacing was a little off for that but over i still gave it five stars and i still really loved it and i still think it's incredibly excellent and one of the best ya books that i've ever read in a long time i don't like zombies i hate zombies i avoid zombies at all costs but i heard such amazing things about these books that i did pick them up and i don't regret it and i think it's one of the best examples of alternate history fiction one of the best examples of what ya can do and should do because ya just because you're targeting uh, a slightly younger audience does not mean you can't deal with complex and difficult social issues but it also in a way that is is approachable for that younger audience but isn't talking down to it isn't dumbing it down isn't sugarcoating it is still confronting these things in all of their horror but in a way that is appropriate for the audience that it's geared toward yeah this this duology is a master class in how to do ya make it real make it dark make it relevant make it interesting make it thought-provoking and still be ya number four i have the girl in the tower which is the second book in the winter night trilogy i actually finished reading the winter night trilogy earlier this year i think i read winter of the witch in may and I didn't like it as much as Girl in the Tower. And Bear in the Nightingale I read this year as a reread. So Girl in the Tower I think is my favorite in the trilogy. It is really, really excellent. Um, the Winter Night trilogy in general is really, really excellent. It is uh, a retelling of various, uh, it's more, it's not a retelling of any particular Russian fairy tale. It is a retelling of like Russian folkloric elements. So there is a lot of just different recognizable pieces of Russian fairy tales, Russian lore, Russian myth, russian ness Russian history as well. The main, the, one of the main things that I love about the series, the thing that makes me love it so, so much is Vasya, the main character. She is one of the best main characters that I've ever read. And she really, really came into her own in Girl in the Tower. And Bear in the Nightingale, she's a child for a large part of the book. I mean, she's still incredible, but I feel like it's already kind of an arm's length narration style, partly due to the folkloric style. Uh, it's told kind of in this more archaic sounding um, prose that is more in keeping with the fairy tale style. So that already is more arm's length. And then the fact that she has a child is even more kind of, I feel like you're at a distance from her in Bear in the Nightingale. In Girl in the Tower, again, she really comes in her own. The plot was the most exciting. The development of all the characters was the most exciting. The return of her brother as a character who we did meet briefly in the first book. And I remember regretting that he kind of left the uh, the scene quite early in Bear in the Nightingale. And uh, so he comes back into it in Girl in the Tower and it's it's so good. It's so good. <laughs> Number three is The Hundred Thousand Kingdoms by N.K. Jemisin. After finishing and loving the Broken Earth trilogy, I began the Inheritance trilogy. And this was actually thanks to my patrons who wanted to buddy read it. I was originally intending on reading the Dreamblood duology next, but they wanted to read 100,000 Kingdoms, so that's what we read. And I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I immediately went out, when I say went out, I went to my computer to order uh, the next two books in the Inheritance trilogy. I'm hoping to get to know this pretty soon, although they are not direct sequels, so there's no immediate rush. Like, it's not like I need to read them before I forget what happens in the first one. They're kind of connected and in the same world, but not a direct sequel. In any event, N.K. Jemisin continues to be a, a new favorite author of mine. This was really different from the Broken Earth trilogy. It was more fantasy e and and yet it was immediately apparent to me that there are certain things that N.K. Jemisin likes to put in her stories and likes to play with. And it was interesting having read Broken Earth, which came after Inheritance in terms of when she wrote it, but I read it first. So to me, reading it in this order, it seemed to me that 100,000 Kingdoms was doing things that I had seen in Broken Earth. And I was like, oh, you're doing that thing again, except Broken Earth was her doing it again. So it, it, it was like seeing kind of the the roots or the sprouts of these some of these ideas that she really fully fleshes out and really kind of runs with in Broken Earth. Kind of seeing her kind of like dipping her toes into some waters that she's curious about kind of exploring a bit. Uh, so I, I kind I don't know if it is, I don't, I have no idea if it would be better to read this first and then Broken Earth the other way around, but I certainly can recommend reading Broken Earth first and then this because it was really fascinating to kind of see the seedlings of these ideas and be like, oh, I see. I see <laughs> the beginnings of some of these ideas. So in any event, um, I loved it so much. And if you want, if you're worried about starting Jemison and her stuff being too difficult or, or too intimidating, 100,000 Kingdoms reads more like a fantasy book. Uh, it's still really inventive and unique because it's N.K. Jemison but it's more in keeping with a more fantasy narrative style than Broken Earth is. So it might be slightly more comfortable to pick up as your first Jemison. 
possibly, potentially. Number two, second best is Royal Assassin by Robin Hobb. Uh, I also finished the Farseer trilogy this year. Um, and once again, I like the second book the best. Uh, Royal Assassin, Chef's Kiss, Knockout, five out of five stars. I would die for night eyes. It's amazing. I, I, I really liked Assassin's Apprentice and also Assassin's Quest. I uh, not, it's not that I disliked them, but Royal Assassin I think is it is the best of the trilogy. I think it is the one that, it is where all of the best things about the trilogy get the chance to shine. So Fitz is at an age now where he's not a child anymore. Um, so he's a fully full-fledged adult. So it's kind of easier to follow his story and kind of be with him. He's fully developed this relationship with Night Eyes. So Night Eyes fully gets to be part of this story when Night Eyes is the best. And Buckkeep is one of my favorite settings. So you get to see lots of Buckkeep, not only Buckkeep, but lots of Buckkeep. A lot of the political intrigue that's kind of begun to, to be a thing in the first book really kind of takes off and becomes really messy and intriguing. Intrigue that is intriguing. Great, great English, Liana. <laughs> anyway, I, I just, I think it's really, really excellent. Uh, a lot of, all of my favorite things about the trilogy basically either happen or are the most best in that one. The one thing that I think maybe shines a little more in the third one is The Fool, but The Fool is amazing in all three books and The Fool is always one of my favorite things in all of the books. And there's lots of The Fool in, in Royal Assassin as well. So yeah. 10 out of 10, loved it so much. Hob is McQueen. <laughs> and the number one so far this year is a surprise. Not, not a huge surprise, but I'm just surprised by how much I liked this. That is Empire of Silence by Christopher Rocchio. Um, this had been sitting on my shelf for some time because I'd heard it recommended and praised in particular by people who are fans of Name of the Wind. And whenever fans of Name of the Wind are like, I like this too, your girl is like, what? So I'd ordered it a long time ago, but I just hadn't got around to it because there wasn't any urgent reason to, so I just hadn't yet. And then Alex, Alex Nieves, um, hauled it. And I was like, I have that. I've been meaning to read that. Let's read it. So we buddy read it and now we're going to buddy read the second and third books as well. And both of us really, really loved Empire of Silence. So we talked about it for like two hours in the live show on my channel. So if you want to watch the replay, that's available. It, and it's a debut. It is such a strong debut. He at one point, uh, he being Alex, said during the live show that we were trying to discuss it and be balanced and fair and professional <laughs> book reviewers. So in theory, you're supposed to sort of talk about pros and cons. And, and he was like, there's, there's nothing that I would like, I can't, I can't think of anything that I would say that I didn't like or that I would change. And I was like, yeah, pretty much. There's things about it that weren't maybe completely perfect, but all around this is one of the best books that for sure that I've read this year. And just generally that I've read, like it is a new favorite and I'm hyping it to everybody all over the place. It is somewhat similar to Red Rising in terms of the fact that this is a sort of, it's a futuristic space opera that is heavily influenced by Rome, Roman culture, Roman names, Roman social structure having kind of these like noble families that own things and are genetically different from poor people. They are longer lived and larger and, and stronger. So in that sense, it's, it's a little bit reminiscent of Red Rising in terms of just like the setup. But as a debut, I will say Empire of Silence is a far stronger debut than Red Rising the book is. Red Rising the book is far from my favorite in that series. And I think is it is a fairly weak debut. Like it's, it's pretty good for a debut from an author who was like 23 when he wrote it. You're like, that being the case, this is pretty solid. Standing next to Empire of Silence, which is also a debut, you're like, well. <laughs> but Empire of Silence though, like that's, that's knockout stuff. And I hear from everybody, and that's what everyone was saying in the chat when we talked about it during the live show, is that Empire of Silence is the weakest one, just like with Red Rising. Only Red Rising, I thought was kind of weak. And I didn't think Empire of Silence was weak at all in any way. <laughs> I, I cannot find a flaw. And this is the weak one. So I am so stoked to read Howling Dark next month with Alex. So uh, the discussion will be on his channel. Hopefully this video goes up before that discussion happens, but I don't know. I am a mess and editing takes a million years. Yeah, Empire of Silence, number one, no question about it. If you haven't read it, read it. If you haven't heard of it, go look it up, then order it, then read it. You will not regret it. So yeah, those are my best and worst so far in 2021. Let me know in the comments down below if any of these books are on your best or worst lists. Uh, if you agree or disagree with me about the ones that I've read that you have also read. If I have inspired or discouraged you from picking any of them up, whatever you want to let me know. I post videos on Saturdays, other random times as well, but definitely Saturdays, so like and subscribe. Join my Patreon if you feel so inclined, and I'll see you when I see you.